Hello and welcome to a guest hosted episode of the Bearded Tits podcast. That's, uh, of course, the Bearded Tit Jack Perks. Uh, my name is Stephen Moss. I'm an author, naturalist and university lecturer and lifelong birder. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome a dear friend of mine and a real pioneer in getting people into birding and broadening out the whole access to nature, Lucy McRobert. Lu welcome, Lucy. Hello, Stephen. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself, summarise your, your career so far? Absolutely. So I'm what you call a portfolio worker, much like yourself. Um, broadly, I'm a communications professional, uh, largely working in wildlife, but also a little bit in heritage and tourism. Uh, recently, I've got my dream job. Uh, working at the Isles of Scilly Wildlife Trust as their communications manager. So it means I just get to talk about amazing wildlife in the best place in the world all day long, which is marvellous. And I have worked with Lush Charity. I've worked with various wildlife trusts around the country, doing magazine editing and communications, appeals, fundraising and so on. Uh, and I'm also a writer. My book, 365 Days Wild, was published in 2019, I think. I always get that wrong. And um, I also am a columnist for Birdwatch magazine, as well as doing various other things as well. Various other things, of course, including mothering your lovely daughter, Georgiana, who is now three and nearly four. She's nearly four. Unfortunately, I don't get paid for that, so I don't include it. That comes under my voluntary roles. <laughs> of which there, I'm sure there are many. Um, you're a not a lifelong birdie. You've always been passionate about nature and wildlife, but you really took up birding in your very early 20s yes right. tell us a little bit about how that came about so i am one of those classic ones that loved nature when i was a kid went outside got kicked out onto the street by my parents at an early age was lucky to live in a rural area with lots of fields uh, lots of safe areas where we could go off exploring so i had what you'd call quite a wild childhood but i should say that that was not based at all around identification i couldn't tell you the difference between a blackbird and a song thrush growing up. I love nature, I love being part of nature, but it was not about species and ID. It was more the enjoyment and the experience of being out in the wild. As always happens, I think, um, when I got to my teenage years, you, you either have a choice between really getting into it and getting really passionate and committed or going off the rails completely. Uh, I didn't go off the rails completely in lots of areas, but I definitely did lose my passion for nature at that point. It didn't come back until I did a course in environmental history at university. Uh, I did a degree in history and realised about a year in that I was actually not that good at it and really did not like history at all. Um, was very lucky to have the opportunity to do environmental history. And from there, I got connected with the big NGOs at the RSPB, the BTO, the Wildlife Trusts. Um, and I started exploring my own lo local nature reserves. Some of my friends thought I was an absolute weirdo and never spoke to me again. Others came out with me and had a great time and have ended up working in conservation as well. And it all came off the back of the loss of my mum when I was 16, which was a very hard period for me, uh, taking GCSEs, then A-levels and going into university. And I found that birding and being part of that birding community, which is largely white, middle-aged, middle-class men. However, I do happen to be friends with a lot of them and get on very well with the vast majority of them. Um, it gave me a bit of a purpose, a bit of a focus and a bit of a, a community feel. I think a lot of young people don't understand the value of having a really good hobby, something that you really can get into and that separates your professional life and your personal life. Uh, so it, it really came from there and it played a huge role in making me feel better in coming to terms with the loss of my mum and also then shaping a career going forward. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it, how birding or a love of wildlife has so many different benefits that you don't necessarily, firstly, you don't necessarily realise them at the time. And secondly, you didn't have a plan to do this. It happened and wasn't it wasn't so much a happy accident in that you have steered your career really well but you have now got into the position haven't you where your hobby overlaps with your job it isn't your job because your hobby and passion for birds involves all sorts of things that you don't get paid for as you say and you do in your free time but obviously there is quite a big overlap how do you feel about that sort of um you know not i suppose it not being a pure hobby anymore i really like it um, I, it does have frustrations at times. Um, I do find if I'm out birding, sometimes I will get cornered about an issue. I'm just out there generally enjoying nature and someone will pounce on me 
in the pub afterwards or uh, and, and you get interrogated a little bit which isn't the most fun part of it because people know that you're into wildlife and they know that you might have a connection with one of the NGOs so you have to answer difficult questions about something you actually know nothing about and actually you're just there to enjoy birds so it does have a downside to it on the other side what I found is that it connects me with so many people who have this incredible breadth of expertise and that actually we don't listen enough in the conservation sector to people on the ground and people who are who are doing the actual birding and doing the actual work and I find sitting in the middle actually can be a very helpful place when you when you start with listening. Um, all good leadership, in my opinion, starts with listening and being in that position puts me, I feel, in a very strong place to be able to share knowledge in both directions and working in communications. That's incredibly important. It's never just a one way traffic. It's always a conversation. So I now really like it. Um, I always think back to when I was a teenager and you have those awful careers conversations with people saying, what are you going to be? And you have to fill in some horrendous survey online that says you're going to be a train driver or something. That's actually what mine said was a train driver. Um, and it's completely based on the mood you're in at the time. And it's just awful. This would never have been on my radar. I didn't really know you could work in marketing. I didn't really know you could work in communications. I think I probably defaulted to teacher because that's what you do if you don't really know what you're talking about when you're a teenager and you say well, I'll just be a teacher because there's lots of teachers around and they seem all right and like nice people um so no I never ever would have put myself down either being a birder or being a naturalist or indeed working in the conservation sector so it was a happy accident in that respect but one that I'm very glad did happen I can't imagine doing anything else right now yes it's interesting isn't it because I think a lot of us in this field have in some form turned our hobby into our job having possibly in some cases i know in my case resisted that for a long time on the principle that you should have a hobby that takes you away from the pressures of, of work mm. but i think you've shown that you can do the two you mentioned the fact that obviously people might corner you to ask you something about your job but they also you, you know you write very well but you are not afraid in your writing particularly in your bird watch column to tackle controversial issues so do people come up and sort of make remarks or question you or challenge you about those when you're out again you're out for a lovely walk with your husband and daughter on a Sunday you want to go and see a bird you might be on a twitch you know does that happen quite a lot well I I get quite a lot of messages and what you find is you get a lot of comments underneath the pieces especially when they go online but actually it's a bit of a dark online world as opposed to a face-to-face -face world and I actually really enjoy going to big twitches because I know that some of them really don't like me and really disagree with what I've said, but they never dare say it to my face. And it's always, I think partly because there's a small child there and it'd be really awkward and partly because there's a big audience and partly because they don't know how I'm actually going to respond. Um, it, it, it gets quite interesting because you kind of, you're standing there next to someone who you know has said something really nasty about you on a forum and I just find it funny now. I, it used to get to me. It really used to bother me if I got like negative comments and negative hate mail. And I'm still not a fan of kind of the social media pylons. I'm lucky that doesn't happen to me very often. I think I've had like two in my entire life. Um, but it, that that can be very intimidating when it's happening online. But then you get out into the field face to face and everyone just avoids eye contact with you. The only comments I tend to get are really positive ones or people wanting to discuss an issue in more depth because I only have like 500 words and they want to hear more about an issue. That's usually me winging it or blagging it or thinking, oh goodness, when did I actually write this column? It could have been literally been six months ago. Which one are they talking about? Yes, uh, so, I saw your column and it's like, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, which, which one? There's one a month. I don't know which one it could be, but I really enjoy actually going out and meeting people. I've never had someone shout at me about my column, although I have had messages and not quite hate mail the worst one was that someone said that they'd never been so offended by anything that they'd ever read ever which <laughs> i thought was extreme um yes. and i've also had someone who described me as inspiring and infuriating in equal measure which frankly that's, that's right. exactly what i'm going for so that's that was a big tick 10 out of 10 and i use that in my twitter bio because i loved it so much that's really good. Although I would say I think you balance because, you know, I, I've read a lot of polemical columns, some of which I agree with, some of which I don't. But I think one of the problems with writers who try to deal with an issue is they often aren't very open. 
for saying, this is my view, and I'm going to back up what my view is, but feel free to disagree with me. And mm -hmm. I think you do this. Now, I don't know, you know, one of the obvious things about you, two of the obvious things about you, uh, which mark you out, or at least until very recently marked you out from the run of the mill, you know, birding community, is that you are young and a woman. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, that is changing hugely, not least down to several of the initiatives you've started, which we'll talk about later. But there is now a huge community of young naturalists, you know, of various genders, sexes, you know, backgrounds, mm -hmm. ethnic backgrounds, whatever, um, which I feel is completely transforming, even though we've got a long way to go, is transforming birding. But nevertheless, I think you're, you know, the fact you have the column in Birdwatch, and there, there are lots of columnists across various magazines. I'm struggling to think of another woman, for example. I'm mm -hmm. struggling to think of another young person who writes a column. Um, young, I mean, sort of under 50, really. Um, mm -hmm. And I understand why that is, but but do you think that you are marked out because you you you, you obviously, particularly when you started, you really stood out and you still stand out as, as someone different from the run of the mill? Absolutely. So when I first started writing, um, Dominic Mitchell, who was the editor of Birdwatch at the time, I know he took a massive gamble on me. Um, and I am very, very grateful for that opportunity. The readership of Birdwatch is very traditional birder. It's very white male middle class, tends to be over 45. Um, and I think a lot of people get very upset about the, oh, we don't see any young birders, we don't see any women. Well, they are there. We have to think about this in the context of what we're actually talking about. And there are more people coming through. If a young person doesn't read Birdwatch magazine, it might simply be because they, they can't afford it at that point in their life or something. It doesn't mean they're not there and they're not engaging with the hobby. It just means that maybe that's not the right outlet for them. Um, I do stand out to a certain extent partly because i've chopped all my hair off and have quite a distinctive hairstyle i know that sounds really silly but it does mean that you're you're more recognizable when you go to these things mm. and also because i do try and talk to people i also talk about my daughter quite a lot in my column and there's this kind of small feral scarecrow running around next to me so all in all it, it just it, it's like oh that must be her because it ticks all of these different boxes and she kind of looks like the photo we've seen in the magazine um i think there are lots more opportunities for young people and women to get involved now with these kind of things and personally i like pushing the magazines i like i like encouraging them to pick up new writers and equally i like encouraging writers who are meeting who are young or female or from ethnically diverse backgrounds to get in contact proactively with the magazines i think there's still this bit of a disconnect between going for what's easy because they're on the staff so well they can just write that because it's quick and easy and they're salaried and getting necessarily the best person to write that article that's a challenge that all publishers across the sector have got to get over it's not just in bird watching it's it's, it's right across the sector sometimes you have to ask one of your regulars to step aside and that's a very conscious decision that they have to make. And that's what happened when I got my column, essentially. It was, I got to take a slot from someone else. And that, that's a hard conversation for people to have. Um, I think with columns, the thing that people always have to remember is they're a caricature of your actual opinion. You are taking sometimes an incredibly complex uh, idea that there's no way you should try and condense it into 650 words, but you do. And it becomes, it, it is a caricature. It's not necessarily the most accurate depiction of what you think. And it does sometimes lack nuance and it does sometimes lack context. And I think that's what riles people up sometimes. I think, oh goodness, she's really oversimplified this issue. I'm a big believer in being able to put your hands up and say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, or I recognize I'm in a minority of opinion here. And you're all gonna be cross with me, but hear me out and please don't shout at me afterwards. This is a starting point of a conversation, not the end point. Absolutely. And being able to do that, I think is probably why I still have my column. I really don't believe in shouting at people. I really don't believe in judging people. I think there are always motivations for everybody's actions. And I don't know if that's because socially, I've been brought up female, men and women are brought up differently, even today. 
and that means that maybe my empathy levels are higher or maybe I dislike criticism more. I don't know, a sociologist or a psychologist would be able to delve into that for you. Um, but I find that actually bringing that different perspective is something that's really valued by lots of birders. And I have been really astounded at times how much support I have received from the wider white male birding community. I, yeah, I just remember when you wrote that piece about women feeling uneasy, scared, frightened, mm. sometimes, often, for good reason, in nature. And this was following, wasn't it, the whole Sarah Everard story. <laughs> and I thought what was really interesting was on social media, one of the most interesting comments came from a young man, I can't remember who it was, who said to all the guys who were criticizing you and getting getting sort of a bit on their high horse and saying, well, I'm not like that, most birders aren't like that. And, and he basically said, guys, you are completely missing the point. It's like walking down the street. Of course, it's not every man. It's hardly any men with attack mm -hmm. would be threatening, but it could be any, anyone. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that was also a point obviously made by a lot of women who also responded. And I thought that was a very good example where you dealt with a really complex subject, which was bound to be misunder willfully misunderstood by some people, but mm -hmm. just misunderstood by people who, who don't get it. Yeah. Uh, and I thought what was great is that you dealt with it in such an open and non-threatening way. I, I've been struck generally by not just you, but many of the young younger people who write or tweet or whatever about issues is what they're not doing is blaming my generation for everything mm. that's gone wrong. And they could do. You know, they don't make they don't generally make flip remarks about, you know, the majority groups in birding or conservation who have dominated for so long. They try to look on the positive side. They try to look at what we can do. And I think that's something you did in, in that. But that was obviously an incredibly sensitive area. Mm -hmm. And you appeared on Channel 4 News, didn't you, with Lucy yeah. Lapwing and did a really interesting film about that. Um, how do you feel that what you wrote and, and, and said has changed or has it changed? So the interesting thing about that piece, partly because it was written incredibly quickly in response to Sarah Everard and then uh, Lucy Hodson did this very emotional thread on Twitter about how she'd had someone indecently expose themselves to her and put her in a really intimidating position. Um, and we thought we just jumped on it with Birdwatch and said, we've got to do something about this because the door's open, we're pushing on an open door with people. What I didn't realise was that they were going to publish it at five past five on a Friday night when they'd all left the office. <laughs> so it kind of went out on Birdwatch channels <laughs> and my phone just started going absolutely berserk. And they weren't in the office, obviously, because it was a Friday night. I don't blame them at all for that. But I was like, oh, no, I've got to deal with all of this. This is hilarious. And it was really nice, actually, to have so much support from people. And the follow ons from that have been incredible. So there's one chap who I've got a huge amount of respect for. I think he's the one you were talking about earlier. Um, he actually went round and printed off copies of the article and stuck them up in all of the rooms at Spurn Bird Observatory um, for men essentially staying there to read and kind of say, look, assess your own behaviour sometimes. And I don't think we're talking about something that's exclusive to birding. And that's something I wanted to make really, really clear. It's more societal issues around, I don't think sometimes men realise how intimidating a behaviour can be and the negative associations that women have with certain things and the way that we are taught to protect ourselves in those situations. So for example, if I'm out running and I run past a car park that has a white van in that car park and I cannot see into the back of that white van, I will immediately be on edge. I'm not saying that there is any threat from that white van driver whatsoever, but I know that I'm in a situation that if it did, if it did escalate, I would be in a very serious situation indeed. And the chances of that happening are very slim, but also very real. I mean, um, I, I remember, you know, when you did that piece and later, uh, Lucy did a very good Radio 4 documentary mm. uh, with a runner, a, a fell runner and a cyclist who'd been attacked or been threatened or be, been fearful at different times. And I tried to think of any time in my 50 plus years of birding that I had felt uneasy. And there were probably two or three Mm -hmm. Right, you know, as a kid going to rain and marsh, which was a bit rough, and there was a guy who's out of his head on drugs. 
you know, but it, they, these are tiny twinges of unease compared to, as you say, what women go through, you know, forget birding, forget being in nature, literally walking down the street. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it wasn't, you know, you joined the whole chorus of people writing thoughtful articles, giving broadcasts, saying, look, guys, just think it through. Just try to empathise and put yourself in their position. Of course, you're, you know, you're walking down the street. You know you're not going to attack a woman walking in front of you. But just go on the other side of the road. You know, it was the, the basic stuff. And I think what, you know, what was great about what you did was that it, it, it was encompassing everyone. It wasn't saying, it wasn't blaming anyone. One. and it certainly wasn't doing what so much of the media did and saying well what women have got to do is this and it's like no 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 no, no, no they don't um now you told me the other day i don't know if you can talk about this that you've taken this to another step now in terms of um representation of women on the magazine so what i can say i can't say much because i don't know when this is going out what I can say is that we've had some really, really productive conversations with Birdwatch that have been so open because it, obviously the issue arises that if you only ever talk about one issue and one negative issue, it becomes the only topic in discussion. And that what we overlook in that instance and what we overlook with that, what, what the risk of overlooking that is, is that you get the impression that actually we're all kind of quaking in our boots and we're too terrified to go out birding. And that's not actually the case at all. And if you go on and on and on about an issue, it becomes a caricature of itself in a way. You either don't take it seriously. This is what happened very much like with climate change. It's so easy for everybody just to go, oh, that must be climate change. But you almost start to ridicule it. And that's what's happened in society. And it's you, you begin to get the scepticism coming back in. And you don't talk about all the amazing things that are going on and all the great initiatives and all the positives. So I've had some amazing conversations with Birdwatch about how we can talk about what women are doing in spite of these barriers. Yeah. <laughs> that They're focused again on the positive and the constructive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, right, we, because the problem is also it can be very counterproductive, can't it? And if mm -hmm. women who are fearful enough as it is, and particularly young women, if they have one bad experience, and that could be a bad experience where they feel unsafe, or probably more commonly, where they just feel put down mm -hmm. by older male birders, which to be fair happened to me in the 70s. You know, they were, uh, you know, growing up then was not easy as a young man yeah there were no young women birders because they would have been you know no not very few because you know they would have really struggled so i think what's great is that you're trying to and i feel this with so many young people you know who are on twitter the, the generation i'm afraid beneath you now isn't it in their team mm -hmm. who are doing such positive yeah. things to raise important issues so i think that that's fantastic yeah and we, we do have to challenge these narratives it's not about saying that these aren't still issues. They absolutely are still mm. issues. And I don't believe that much has changed on the ground. What we do know is that conversations off the back of that article and off the back of um, Lucy's uh, radio show and the Channel 4 news piece has prompted conversations in the highest levels of RSPB, in the highest levels of the Wildlife Trust, saying, actually, we've never looked through our, looked at our nature reserves through this lens before how do we change this it's prompted tour companies to offer women only tours that you accept you're not going to get as many people on but because, because this isn't a, a, an area that they've ever explored before the idea of going out to some of these countries that are perceived as being unsafe in a women only group it's going to take time for those things to build um but what we do know is that that conversation has started what we don't want is it for it to be the only conversation that's had there are lots of conversations to be had and obviously I'm talking about this as a straight white woman. I, I know I have friends who have faced so many more barriers from being gay or queer, from being from becoming from an ethnic background. They, these issues are very, very complex. And I'm aware that I've grown up with huge privileges and that gives me the voice to be able to say these things. Whenever we're planning a conference, writing a magazine, uh, looking for people to contribute to an article, whatever it is, we do have to consider our own unconscious biases we have to consider our own privileges, not in a negative way. You can't help privilege a lot of the time. It's not something that says, oh, you're a bad person because you're rich. That's it's not what the conversation is. It's about saying being self-aware of the benefits you might have received in life for certain circumstances beyond your control and making sure that you're conscious of them and that you redistribute that privilege where you can. And sometimes that may, might mean stepping aside and saying, actually, I'm not going to do that, but here's a better person who can do it better than me. 
and that will improve your diversity and representation and that will give this person a voice that's the most important thing is giving that person a voice and, 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 that, and those conversations are basically what's happening now and that is so important yeah absolutely and not and not just I mean, i'm not saying it's from a cynical point of view but it is in any organization's interest to have a diverse mm -hmm. of contributors because then you represent the british population and then you reach into communities who traditionally have not been remotely involved in conservation um whether they be urban urban communities or different ethnic groups or whatever um so you know it, it makes sense in the long term as well as being a good thing so it's win-win isn't it? it's not a zero-sum game that you absolutely you get rid of some people and also you know the danger of course the danger would, would always be that you lose your expertise um if you exclude the people who are there already it, you know, it shouldn't be about that no you know, absolutely not you, you very much need expertise in any organization it should never be about quotas it should never be about oh we've done this because and i've seen that in some birding organizations where they've, they've pulled a, uh, a statistic out of thin air and gone oh we want all our committees to be 50 50 by 2024 it's never going to happen and you know it's not going to happen it's not going to happen and what you're going to do is you're going to get your engagement committee so it's 70-30 in favour of women and go, oh, actually, this other committee that's seen as the expert committee, we doesn't really we can ignore that one because we oversold on that bit so we can undersell on that bit. It doesn't address the actual issue, which is a visibility, representation, voice and opportunity. And opportunity is a really hard one. I recognise it's more work for everybody. It's really easy just to go to your mates who are probably like you. They reinforce your values. They probably look like you in some respect. It's really easy to keep defaulting to that. And I actually refused to take part in a conference on rewilding last year because I was one of only two women on the stage. And I just went, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not putting my name to this. You haven't tried hard enough. And they got very upset and very defensive. That I'm really angry, actually. The emails I got back from them were really aggressive. And I was going, this is why I can't take part. Look at the way you're talking to me because I've called out something that you've done. No wonder women don't want to come on your stage if that's the way you're bloody talking to them. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's very interesting. Interestingly, recently I had a letter inviting me to be on a committee of a very diverse group of experts in the sense of diverse in the sense of, you know, I'm not a professional conservationist, so it's uh -huh. all different groups of people. And I had a very quick read through. And of course, you have to be very, very careful with names because, you know, uh -huh lots of names might be female but as far as I could tell of the 15 or 16 people all but one were men and yeah. I will make a little point back because this committee isn't set up yet you know because but and I understand why you know I get I get why that's happened because when you read the names you go oh yeah so and so yeah well he obviously knows what he's talking about so does he don't so does he but as you say it's not good enough anymore no, and it's self-reinforcing. One person, it's very hard because the one person for the job might be an older white middle class man. Of course. And they might be the best person. But if you're picking a committee or, uh, or, or as you say, putting on a conference, then there really is no excuse. And you want to hear from young people. You want to hear from people from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise, what's the point in doing it? Uh, Absolutely. I think people don't recognise the societal issues as well. There's big things. Oh, well, we don't want to pay people. And then they go, oh, but this group of people will do it for free. And they're all white and male in the yeah, class. And you go, yeah, yeah. But why can they do it for free? It's not that they're nicer people. It's that there's all kinds of sociological issues with women and perception of childcare and their perception of how they raise their kids. It's to do with young people physically not having the time to keep working for free like we're expected to. It's to do with all sorts of issues. It's to do with people who represent diverse backgrounds. And they are so overworked and overused because the moment they say they've had a racist experience or they speak out against racism, every organization wants them to come and talk to their staff for free. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, no, put your hand in your pocket and pay for it. Oh, but we can do it for free with that person. Yes, you can. But why? Why will that person do it for free? Whereas this person is saying, sorry, but I really need to get paid for my expertise here. Yeah, we had that experience on a, a large um board of trustees that I was on for a very large conservation organization which obviously I can't name and they were doing their absolute best uh, and they did improve it during the time I was there in terms of representation but the issue came up about young people and several people to be fair raised the point that how is a young person going to be able to give up eight days in a year plus the pre-reading mm -hmm. 
to come, yes, expenses paid, but to come with no pay to London to attend these meetings. Um, and of course they can't. I mean, no. there's no way. And, and either for financial reasons or for childcare reasons or for the fact they might be students. So they, they, they have a timetable or they have a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm freelance. I could afford to give up that time, you know, but others couldn't. Um, and I think, you know, I think things are changing, aren't they? Yeah. Things are getting better, not not least down to, to some of the things you've done. I wanted to, so we've gone a long way into this without me mentioning, <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing you've done and the thing that still um, impresses me, uh, AFON, Focus on Nature. Mm -hmm. and let me just explain to the listeners if they don't know about it. Focus on Nature is an extraordinary organisation which um, was founded 10 years ago now. Oh, it would have been, yeah, about yeah. then, 10, 11 years ago. Uh, at Bird Fair. And if you read on the website, it always says, you know, it was founded by uh, Lucy McRobert, Dr. Rob Lambert, Stephen Moss and Pete Gamby from Optic Rob. Well, I'm going to be honest, it was you. Uh, Pete put quite a lot of effort yeah. in. Rob and I listened to what you had to say and offered some, I think, fairly helpful advice, but frankly, yeah. did nothing else. Uh, we still get introduced as the founders or the co-founders. And I've been to the conferences and I've stood up and said, you know, let's be fair, I'm not. But I'm I'm very proud by association of what you did because you started an organisation that I think hits the zeitgeist of young people being concerned about nature and thinking, oh, I'm into birds or wildlife and I might want a career in it, but I've got no idea because I'm 15, 16, 18, 21, whatever, how on earth I'm going to do it. So can, can you talk a little bit about how it came about? No, absolutely. So essentially coming out of, a history degree and thinking I want to work in conservation but I, I've no, literally no idea where to start. Um, I volunteered a bit with Knott's Wildlife Trust, um, I volunteered a bit with Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust but I, I really didn't know exactly how to turn the skills I had into a job or what kind of jobs were available and there was also this uh, big misconception that was perpetuated again, it was one of those self-perpetuating myths that young people weren't really interested in nature and conservation. I'm sorry, I really don't believe this. So if anything, what I'm proud that AFON did was first of all, give visibility to a huge amount of people. When I first went to Bird Fair, what, 10, 11 years ago, there was four of us, four young women walking around and we instantly got nicknamed the Saturdays because it was unusual like there was actually four young people there and that was so depressing in a way because it's like oh goodness why is why is this unusual um and then the next year there were 20 and then the year after that there were 100 and actually it, it gave visibility the other thing that it did was push the ngos because conservation is largely conducted through the ngo world and also <laughs> since then organizations and government organizations like natural england and defra to not just consider the usual kind of young person model which is oh we'll give them a membership magazine four times a year and it'll have some cute crosswords in it and a couple of nice articles um and we'll encourage them to go nature go to our nature reserves and go pond dipping and it, it pushed it pushed the boundaries of professionalism and now there's all sorts of things happen within these organizations that i believe maybe wrongly maybe i'm over egging it a little bit um but i believe started with AFON and yeah, start saying i think you hit a zeitgeist in that social media helped hugely because i mm -hmm. remember a young man saying to me two incidents happened one was a young man said to me i thought i was the only birder at my school but i joined a and then i went on social media you know and found three others in the local town yeah we're now friends and we go out together and he probably wouldn't have carried on birding because he was on his own yeah and the other one was a young woman who i was mentoring who we gave a lift to bird fair and at the end of it not only had she made about a hundred contacts she had cards from everyone but she introduced me to a young guy and she said oh this is you know andy and i said oh hi andy how do you two know each other and she said oh we don't but we've been following each other on facebook for the last three years and this was you know eight nine years ago i was fairly new to social media and i was like oh right so so you have these friends who you actually don't know but you feel you know and i think you you know you hit that moment Mm -hmm. which meant that they had a way of connecting beyond, you know, which, which fitted in, I suppose, with what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, model, reality. The, the APON model isn't perfect. 
Um, it doesn't suit everybody. It doesn't work for everybody. It's a lot of hard work for the committee who have to run it. Um, it it's constantly changing and evolving to try and meet the needs of what people actually want. I think part of it is that the expectation of what we want is actually too high. And actually, it's not it's not about offering something that's really high level and really tailored. There are other organizations who are better set up to do that. It is about providing a collective voice. We ran a conference which had 150 young people attend. We published a report called Vision for Nature that ended up all over the place with the big NGOs. Some of our ideas in that were taken forward. But most importantly, it was about visibility and it, it was about challenging in a very gentle way, not in a critical way, what the NGOs were saying when they said, oh, there's no young people interested. There's it, It's that self-perpetuating myth. You go, no, 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 there are. And they're all dead keen and they might not engage with you in the way that you want them to. But you're going to see this name popping up and over and over again on uh, your job applications that are coming in. We're making it so that people feel confident applying for jobs with you. We're making sure they've actually heard of you. It's one good thing because quite often you hadn't. People have been given advice by people perhaps mm -hmm. two or three years ahead of them. Because what I love about April now is that quite a lot of the people I mentored 10 years ago, of course, they were in their mid-20s then. They're now, like you, doing quite important jobs in conservation. Mm -hmm. so they are now influencing, you know, and, and trying to bring people in behind them in a way that I think didn't really happen no. before, for lots of reasons, and it wasn't people's fault. Again, I think the world has changed. You know, social media rightly gets a lot of critics, but I think what it did do was give people a sense of community. Yeah which we still have. And I remember at Bird Fair, because I would be asked each year to take a photograph of people. And one year I could barely fit everyone in. I think there were 150 yeah. members there on the Saturday night. That was an amazing feeling. I'd done a report for the National Trust, which basically it wasn't really about naturalists. I thought it was when they commissioned me. It was really about the fact that children don't go outdoors. You talked mm -hmm. about your childhood and you were allowed, but you were an exception. And I was mm -hmm. I was meeting young people then and saying, for example, my work at the BBC, and saying, oh, how did you get to nature? Oh, we lived on a farm. Oh, my mum's a botanist. My dad's a birder or, you know, or whatever. You know, there was always a good reason for them to have nature. Whereas for you and I and many of us, particularly my generation, you just went out and your mum said, be back home for tea. <laughs> and I think what was fascinating was that report, I was so... I wasn't proved wrong because there still are a lot of barriers to children going out in nature in the outdoors. But what I loved was the fact that literally almost the moment that report came out, you launched AFON very modestly as a sort of mentoring and giving a bit of advice group. And it just, as you say, it, it exploded because the need was there. Absolutely. It, it bridged a gap and it also took away some of the the fear and barriers that the big organisations could, and they run with it on their own now. That's the thing is it doesn't all fall under the AFON banner. It can't do, we don't have any paid staff, so it can't do. But I love that the BTO do their bird camps every year. And that when their conference was on, they had young people represented in panels. And there were celebrities like Chris Packham and all the rest of them who were actively reaching out to young people after that and supporting them it gave parents more confidence supporting their kids on social media um which i do believe young people shouldn't be allowed unattended on social media uh, I, i'm a big believer in support networks in that because it can be a very scary world um and it, it, it's led to young people publishing books at like the age of 13 14 15. okay those people weren't directly involved with afon i'm not saying that they were but when AFON started, it was pushing on a door that basically started the conversation. Yes. And those organisations didn't need to be under the AFON banner. It wasn't about being under our brand. It was about saying, you can do this and be empowered to make those decisions. And they did. And that's the great thing. Yeah, because you had a, originally, it was 18 to 30, wasn't it? And suddenly people were saying, well, I want to be in it. My older brother's in it. I want to be in it. And you get contacted by 11-year-olds who had their own blog, which yeah. was brilliant. You know, you know, I'm talking about, you know, he's probably about 20 now. Um, but also, I remember we invited a whole group of AFORM people to our home um, mm -hmm. the weekend. And one of them turned up with her mum. And we thought, oh, that's really nice. Thank you. know, thank you for coming. Um, you know, what was it about it? She said, well, my daughter's 15. I have to be here. And it was like, oh, duh. You know, mm -hmm. I thought they were all over 18, you know. But the fact that 15-year-olds were interested enough and brave enough to come on a weekend with other people, a bit older than them, which is pretty hardcore, you know. Yeah. And I know Chris was very supportive. You know, I 
did some theatre events with him and lots of young people, members of AFORM were coming up to him and chatting and, you know, um, and I think generally people were. I know uh, my Rose Craig was telling me the other day how much Bill, Bill Oddie supported her. Mm -hmm. Bill didn't need to do that, you know, uh, but he did because he could see that we needed to change. There is a great story, isn't there, that, that conservation, not a great story, a terrible story, The conservation is the second least diverse industry in terms of racial, uh, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic uh, groups. And I've always wondered what the, first, the least diverse mm -hmm. one is. And someone said publishing, but I don't think it is publishing because in my experience, publishing is pretty diverse. Um, certainly not journalism. It's not a state agency. You know, it, it's not accountancy. You know, I mean, if you think of professions where you know people, where you've worked with people, mm -hmm. and they maybe it's farming. Sorry, sorry, farmers, if you're listening, it's probably farming. Um, and it's interesting what you said earlier, much earlier, about the fact that about the situation of women, that it is, it's not a birding or conservation problem, this is a society problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, we're entering controversial territory the other day, but the other day there was a tweet about something that was happening, and it might be the, you know, this thing that you can now arrest people for protesting when they're on their way and they haven't done anything yet. Yeah. And I thought, you know, as a 60-something middle-class white man, I actually read this and thought, I'm really worried about this, and I'm the least targeted person there, mm -hmm. not being targeted by this in a way that anyone young or black or gay is going to be targeted, if, particularly if it's obvious, and you know, any, any obvious characteristic or anything there, any sign they're waving or whatever, mm -hmm. that they will be targeted. What are your feelings about this intolerance in society now that seems in my view to be coming from the very top i suspect that it's i think quite often when you get clamping down on behaviors it's it's a fear response and to me this is coming directly from government and directly from big businesses who are realizing that the challenges that they're facing are actually very very real and that the knee-jerk reaction to confronting this. So if you've got Extinction Rebellion, for example, protesting about climate change, um, I should say, I don't agree with all of Extinction Rebellion's tactics by any stretch of the imagination. I have huge sympathy for mothers who have become separated for hours from their children because of a roadblock. And I understand it's disrupting business as usual, but as a mother, stand between me and my child and see what happens. <laughs> and I, I think lots of mothers would agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's more of a biological primeval urge rather than anything um, anything kind of moral or ethical and I, I suspect that the government and big businesses are having these knee-jerk reactions because these conversations are happening uh, we do have freedom of press that's optimistic at times um, but we do social media in this country is not overly uh, clamped down on in countries like it is with China etc and Russia where it's very state controlled and I think these conversations are happening and I think that young people and diverse groups are really beginning to speak out more about injustices and we're beginning to see the links with failure in certain industries to tackle big issues and the diverse representation that that entails. If you look at the conservation sector and you kind of say, well, why, why is it so white and male? Um, actually, in the staff, it's not that male anymore. Um, the, the gender representation is definitely improving and is improving very quickly. But I would suspect that even, especially the smaller organisations, the smaller you go, it's it's harder to tackle. And I think that's just because of where it came from. That's because of the roots of it. It was founded by well-off men who had the time and the energy and the money to be able to care about that plot of land that they're going to campaign to buy. And their wives went and made the cakes that they sold at the cake sales, but it was the men on the committees. And that still hangs over. That's what I mean about those accidental biases. Um, that when the new people wanted to be on the committee, you're always going to err towards someone who's like you because you trust them. And I think we're still tackling that at a, when it comes to the smaller NGOs and the smaller organisations like bird clubs, really small wildlife trusts and stuff like that. That's where it's really hard to tackle. The RSPB, WWF, etc. they've got it easy because they can hire big companies to help them do it because they've got the money to be able to do it. And they can search from the biggest pool of people. Um, so th they're, they're finding it easier. Um, I think there's a lot of frustrations, um, especially from 
young people and from minority groups about what they perceive as a lack of action uh, because they don't understand how slowly things move in the real world. Um, it's very easy to finger point and it's very easy to get very frustrated at a situation and say that I'm being victimized and all the rest of it when actually it's nothing to do with that. It, it's, a, it's a complex business world in many respects. So I think there's more and more of these groups forming. And my suspicion is that, I, I, this is personal opinion entirely, I, I suspect that governments and big businesses are genuinely scared of this. You only have to look at how popular veganism is now as a lifestyle choice. Um, it, it's gone so far beyond being, oh, I don't eat meat because I like animals, to being like an environmental decision or a lifestyle choice or a health decision, um, that these are all causes of concern for people who like business as usual okay. and who like the status quo. And I suspect that with a right-wing Tory government in place, as we've had for the past few years, we've had really toxic poisonous narratives uh, to do with Brexit, and it did not take a genius to look through the untruths of what was being said. But anyone who challenged or, or or pushed against that was shot down. You got reference to something bad that happened to them in the 70s, so they'll only ever trust the Tories to vote for. Um, that was my dad's argument anyway. He started going on about socialism in the 70s or something. Um, so that default well, it's always... It's like century to you, isn't it? It's yeah. like, I mean, I remember it, but yeah, it, it seems a very long time ago, even to me. Yeah. <laughs> You, it's like talking about the war. Oh, absolutely! It's like, you know, it's like yeah, come on, leave it. Well, well, except of course the Tories are still talking about the bloody war. <laughs> well, that that's the thing, and I I think there's a, a, a genuine fear of challenging business as usual, and I think that's why we're getting these clamp downs in laws, which are fundamentally stripping away human rights yeah. and fundamentally stripping those things away. But we've seen this before. You don't have to look at the suffragettes and. Um, the injustices served against women who were campaigning for something that we now take in UK and to a certain extent wider Western society as a complete fundamental right, which is everyone over the age, over the age of 18 has the right to vote. Personally, I'd drop it to 16, actually, because I think that would be a right giggle. Let's see what happens then. And I feel like I might be in the majority rather than the minority for once. Um, and I think that people are pushing more on those boundaries and it, it's scaring people in power there's actually a reasonably small amount of people who decide and you only have to look at what's going on with the conservative leadership election to realize that however much we love democracy it's really not that democratic yeah. um what 160,000 people or something are going to pick who, who well we don't know because they won't release the number so we actually don't know how many no. But yes, I think 70% of them are in favour of hanging. So, and that's not, exactly. that's actually true. So I think, um, you know, you talk about business as usual. I think one of the key things, isn't it, is that by increasing diversity in the broadest sense in any organisation, you get people to question things. My experience of working in many organisations is one of the, I think the thing that makes an organisation strong is the thing that makes it weak. And I'll give you an example. I worked for the BBC Natural History Union. I moved in the late 90s from a department in London, which was education department, which was entirely run by women. The, all, my three bosses, the next hours up, were women. And that was partly because it was seen as soft television. Mm -hmm. So there were historical and social reasons for that. I moved to the Natural History Union, where even I think about seven or eight years after I got there, there was a vacancy for the head and 11 people applied and were interviewed and they were all men. And the reason for that was, in London, television was run by people in their 30s, mm -hmm. so quite a good diversity, even in the 90s, certainly male, female. Yeah. Um, and in Bristol, people stayed forever because they loved it so much. And this is true in the conservation world generally, isn't yeah. it? That people devote their lives to conservation, which means that it's not, it's that there is a big cohort of very expert, dedicated, fine people Mm -hmm. male but not entirely at the top of these conservation organizations and therefore it's very hard to change course completely and that's true in political parties it's true in industries you know but if you don't you will die you know the famous mm -hmm of Kodak wasn't it in the in the 90s where digital came in and all the men who ran Kodak who were all passionate photographers which is why it's such a good company said well this will never catch on <laughs> Kodak disappeared because it made film yeah um and I think you know this this is going to happen um it's just occurred to me talking to you and listening to your your not just honesty but your your way of so articulately 
explaining things in such an inclusive way. When are you going to go into politics? <laughs> no amount of money in this world could incentivize me to go into politics. I, I would go into local government when I'm older. Um, I wouldn't mind being a councillor or something like that. But at present, again, it's it's the usual it's the usual barriers that you just face. And I think part of it that we underestimate is the emotional resilience you need to step into that space. And I, I don't have that emotional resilience at the moment. And I'm in a good place, but I kind of recognise that I would be in a very bad place if I went into that world. Um, well, that's a terrible indictment of politics, isn't it? Because it yeah. broadly means that the people who go into it have to have, if not an independent income, they have to have a certain degree of money uh, education connections, mm -hmm. all those things. Some of which you have, you know, you've been to yeah, yeah. that sort of thing. But and 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 as you say, you know, you you have lots of levels of, of privilege in your life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yet, if someone like you couldn't even contemplate going into politics, I think that is a huge indictment on on the world we live in. Well, there's that famous quote from Douglas Adams that I adore. Um, and I thought about this the whole way through when Donald Trump was elected and the entire way through his presidency. And it was anyone who is capable of getting themselves elected should absolutely not be allowed to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. And that's essentially what it is. I don't apply this to all politicians by any stretch of the imagination, but you are talking about a certain level of narcissism at the highest levels of politics is not what politics is meant to be about. Politicians are meant to listen. Politicians are meant to be representative. If anything, they're not meant to have that strong views because they're meant to represent the constituency. And um, I've met some very good politicians who I who I thought, wow, great people. Then you look at their voting record and you go, what? Like, this isn't representative. This isn't this isn't fair. You admit what's happened in America with the stripping back of the abortion rights is it's terrifying. As a woman, that is absolutely terrifying, what terrifying facing it, now. it could happen here because the the situation we have with our democracy mm -hmm. and the the internal biases within that are not that different from america are they i mean my mother used to say my late mother used to say the great thing about america is anyone can become president the bad thing is that someone can you know yeah and people like reagan who she was talking about then but obviously trump are a good example of that but that's clearly now true here isn't it if, if, if a a self-confessed liar and total narcissist can not just become prime minister, but then feel aggrieved that he's been thrown out. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm talking about David Cameron uh, and the other one, uh, who I won't mention. You know, but it is it's it's it is frightening. I mean, we've digressed a lot off these things. On a, on a more more positive note to end with, um, you've talked a lot about being a mother about Georgiana about you know and I know her and you and I see you together what are your hopes for her mm -hmm. in the future because you know we talk don't we we talk and that I, I said at the AFOM conference of years ago I talked about you know the fact that when you're younger you talk very glibly about our children and our children's children mm -hmm. and then you suddenly wake up one morning and it's happened you have children and in my case about to have children's children and you go hang on so what what are you thinking in terms of her, my, particularly in this world, yeah, you know, the world we live in now? My hope for her is that she can benefit from and prosper in a world that is vaguely similar to the one that I have grown up in, but better. It terrifies me that that might not happen. It, it absolutely terrifies me that as I am slipping away off this mortal coil, she is left in a situation in the middle of her life where they are facing crop failure, where they are facing war constantly, where they are facing serious dramatic climate change that is making huge parts of the world uninhabitable, that they are facing rationing, food shortage, food shortage poverty, because it, it's just so far away from the world that so many of us are used to, it's actually inconceivable because you, you only have to like walk around the city centre and you see all these happy smiling faces in the sunshine and they're all spending money on stuff that they don't need and you just kind of, it, it terrifies me actually, it really really scares me and the way I deal with that is to switch off 
from it. Like so many people, they go, how do you cope with eco-anxiety? No, I just don't think about it. Yeah, I I think you're not on your own there. But you say, you know, you're frightened this will happen in, you know, you're looking at 50, 60 years time. Mm. But we've all noticed, haven't we? We're, we're doing this interview and it might have rained by the time this gets put out, but we're doing it on one of the hottest days this year in the middle of August at a point where you want to enjoy this. You want to look outside as I am now in this glorious blue sky, this beautiful scene of the Somerset countryside and think, this is nice because that's what we would have thought probably five years ago, so yeah. 10 years ago, certainly when we were children, I grew up in the 76 summer, we loved it, but we don't feel that anymore, do we? we no, and it, even people who I know who do feel, who are like loving it, and I, I, I'm not, I'm a sun worshipper. I'm, we all love it, but yeah. we now have this other thing, don't we? It's this absolute pressing thing at the back of your mind going, this isn't good. What I can't get my head around because I don't have that level of knowledge. It's it's not it's just pure ignorance on my on my part. Is the amount of people, older people, who I'm talking to, who go, well, this every summer was like this. Every summer was like this in the sixties, oh, seventies, the eighties. And I go, I don't think it was. I think you probably had one summer like this, and you've extrapolated that into your entire childhood. Yeah. The irony is, we didn't even have one summer like this because seventy six. I was sixteen. It was a very formative year for me. Um, it was about five degrees, five to seven degrees cooler than the, mm. the peak we've had here this year. And that is a phenomenal difference. Yeah. You know, that five to seven degrees. Uh, and we didn't have the wildfires. We didn't have, yeah, you know, of course it was, a, 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 but also it was exceptional. Yeah. And now um, worry is the, this isn't. But. The, the canal I've just run up and down is dry. And I'm sure it's not the first time it's dried out. I'm sure it's not. And that's the thing is that one time that it didn't dry out is the one that's quoted out. You're going, oh, this is a normal occurrence. Like, no, it's not. This is abnormal and it's going to become normal and that's not good. Exactly. No, absolutely. Now, I've got what apparently Mark Constantine called bird Tourette's. And you'll just bear with me a second as I look out. Bullfinch. Sorry, just had a... Have a first hobby of the year over the house I, was betting on around, I thought it's a kestrel and I had to you know I sit in my office in my garden so sorry about that absolutely. but you'll understand that won't you <laughs> absolutely I got very excited about a sparrow hawk that literally landed on the path in front of me while I was running earlier but it shows that that behavior shouldn't have happening that that sparrow hawk was desperate enough for food that it was willing to land eight feet in front of me yeah and stare me down in a way that says try it try and run past me right now and luckily i'm someone who knows what sparrow hawk is thinks they're marvelous so step back in the opposite direction yeah but interesting isn't it because the the reports the other day and again this shows how we've undergone this quantum shift isn't it we would all have been delighted if slightly frustrated because it's a long way away from me that that the bee eaters are breeding in norfolk mm -hmm. when it happened in 2002 there was an attempt you know really exciting not exciting anymore is it it's it's no. it's you know and that's what i mean about this ambiguity you know we love the summer days you love seeing a sparrow hawk that close we love you know i'd love to pop over and see the bee eaters you know if i was in norfolk i'd definitely go and see them but yeah um, i'm trying to end on a light note and we're struggling a bit aren't we no there's <laughs> plenty to be hopeful for that that's the thing is that in, in, in amongst all of the bad stuff there are wonderful things happening you've got to be don't you you, ha you can't work in the jobs you and i do and many no. of our friends and colleagues um who <coughs> are listening to this and who you know you started at the beginning by saying what you loved about this world was you've made so many new friends contacts colleagues people people who care about the same things we may disagree about some things but we we care and i think that's probably the note we need to leave this on isn't it that there is a fantastic community of people out there and they're all working their butts off to try to save the planet, frankly. Absolutely. And I think we need to, I, I don't even know where you begin with that conversation. I work in communications and every day I ask myself, how do you communicate this? And there's a lot of people who are very scared and they're looking around for an answer. They're looking around and I think there will be an answer, actually. Um, I used to very much be in the camp of individual action and that individual choices can make a big difference. And I still am in that camp to a certain extent, but I, I am becoming less enamored with the decisions that individuals can make 
versus the decisions that need making yeah. at a higher level. I, I have come to the conclusion actually that there's enough people in the world who are either not willing to make changes, who are unable to make changes, or who do not understand that they need to make changes, that those decisions unfortunately do need to be enforced. Yeah. And that is not a popular government. No yeah. government, no one's going to vote for that government, but unfortunately, to me, that's what we need. We yeah. need people who are willing to make changes and dictatorship, don't we? I mean, one of the problems is, and I only came across this notion fairly recently, which is particularly stupid of me, I think, that by corporations and governments promoting the individual action, it actually lets them off the hook. Yeah. It's virtually so, significant. It's so difficult, isn't it? Because we all think we should recycle. We all think we should try to save energy. Now we have a very good reason to. But, you know, quite a lot of altruistic decisions we make in our lives are based on trying to help the planet. Mm -hmm. But that isn't enough. And it's it's almost more than not enough. It can actually go the other way. But, yeah, well, fingers crossed this will work. Um, Lucy, I hope it will. Huge, sorry, yeah, carry on. No, no, I'm just saying I hope it will. Yeah, well, that's a, that's, let's end on that note. Um, it's been a huge pleasure to talk to you, as always. I think that you are, for me, a sort of symbol of a whole... It's not even a generation anymore. It's, it's, it's a swathe of young people, really, from very young up to their sort of mm -hmm. mid-30s, who have given my generation a huge amount of hope. Conservation, and I think you know the work you do individually and collectively, but particularly individually for you, is is tremendous. So keep it up. Um, it's been lovely talking to you. I uh, just like to do a quick plug for the lovely Jack. If you, he he's asked me to say there is a link in the description to this podcast. I don't even know how these things work, but to buy me a um, coffee dot com where you can basically donate. Um, I think it's a virtual coffee, although. Maybe he wants one. Um, and that will help the podcast. You can donate just three pounds to help keep it going because Jack does this voluntarily. You can leave a review. That also really helps if you can share it with people on social media. Lucy and I have both got a lot of followers. We'll be sharing it, but please retweet it, reshare it on whatever platform you're using. Um, but yeah, it has been a huge pleasure to talk to you, Lucy. And um, I think we'll bring it to an end there. So thank, thank you. you so much, Stephen. And thank you, Jack, as well. Absolutely. He's a good guy. I don't care what you say about him. He's lovely. <laughs>